Disclaimer. Please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk. Then play at half speed. Thank you. That's yes, IT, that's Dan. You're going to dock with the Russian space station who will refuel the shuttles with liquid O2. Oh, okay, uh, hold on. That's our software, guys. Um, hold on, let me transfer you over. Uh, this is Josh. Hey, lab, the, uh, the, the pressure's climbing. Yeah, you're going to need to pull the lever, but don't do it just yet. Because if you do it right now with the current rate of flow as it is, you're going to be pulling the weight of the station, and that's not going to be easy. Um... So just give me a second. I gotta make a couple adjustments. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, upload the new code for you. See, done. There, yeah, you should be good. Check your hoses. We got some thermal variation. Oh, that's normal. Oh shit, is that a thousand? That's supposed to be a hundred. I fucking put the decimal in the wrong. Place. So call me back if you have any issues. NASA IT, this is Dan. Oh, okay, hold on. Um, yeah, that's not us. Uh, let me send you over to the server, guys. NASA IT, this is Tom. There's too much debris, we gotta peel off! Oh, yeah, your navigation is pointing to our old server. Uh, we've been having some problems with that. Let me just point you to our new server. And... and... Yeah, that should do it. Houston, independence is a dead stick. We're not gonna make it. Ooh, unfortunately, I don't have the administrative privileges to remap your drives. You may just need to give it 24 hours to apply, otherwise try rebooting. Thanks and have a nice day. Ugh, oh, calls just keep coming today. NASA IT, this is Dan. We got some bad news. The remote detonator on the bomb has been damaged. Okay, uh, let me just remote in and see if I can take care of that real quick. Okay, looks like, yep, yeah, your version of Java is not compatible with your remote detonator. Uh, do you have a different one? They should have sent you with a different one. What are you doing with a gun in space? Um, you're gonna need to contact your project manager for that. Um, but hey, there's gonna be a survey after this. Um, just, uh, please be sure to rate your experience. Thanks! Well, let's shift, guys. You wanna go grab a beer or something? Dear God, yes. Yeah, nothing else going on. Yeah, maybe a movie, too. I could use a beer in a movie. Oh boy. Yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. Rise and shine, campers. Put on your booties, because it's cold outside. It's cold out there every day. That's right, woodchuck chuckers. It's Groundhog's Groundhog Day. Day. It's the Groundhog Day Parade to Punxsutawney. We've got everything here in this here parade. Hey, it's Hoosiers with Gene Hackman. Oh, and uh, Dennis Hopper. In speed. Oh, wow. Now we have Keanu Reeves in... Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. Oh, my God. And William Sadler. Die Hard 2. Oh, my God. Bruce Willis. Armageddon. Don't look now. Don't look now. It's Ken Hudson Campbell. To... Groundhog's Day! Parade down the streets of Punxsutawney with Dan, Tom, and Josh every Tuesday at the fire pit as they make their way down to the most timeless holiday of the season, Groundhog's Day! The winter may be long, but hey, they got you, babe. Do, 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 do. Good evening, bots and listeners, and welcome back to an out-of-this-world edition of The Fire Pit. I'm Tom, British name Thompson. Last week, we learned the heroes always roll 20s, and tonight, we learn a lesson The Simpsons taught us all the way back in Season 5. Not anyone can be an astronaut. But as per our rules, we've taken an actor or actress from our last film and moved them to this one. And now to tell us about who we're watching and what we're watching, we go crashing towards Nigel. Thank you, Thompson. Nigel here, American name Dan. And last week we watched Bruce Willis get all the lucky rolls as he fired blanks at William Sadler in 1990's Die Hard 2. And tonight... We'll take Bruce Willis from the airport to the launch pad in 1998's Armageddon, a totally accurate movie about oil drillers learning to be astronauts and saving us all from impending doom. Totally accurate. 
And to give us a rundown of this film, I'm going to slingshot around the moon and send things over to Josh. Well, thank you, Dan. Thank you. Josh here, British name Reginald. And uh, tonight we are watching the 1998 seminal classic Armageddon, starring Bruce Willis, Ben Affleck, and one Billy Bob Thornton, in addition to Liv Tyler and Michael Clark Duncan, who we saw all the way back during our field trip to Kingtown. Yeah, and, and also the Green, Green Mile. Mile. That's right. He's a he's a two peat, mm-hmm. isn't he? Mm-hmm. Which is just a repeat. That's it's called a repeat. Yes, Tom. Thank thank you for that. You're welcome. <laughs> Anywho, Armageddon premiered July first, nineteen ninety eight. It has a running time of one hundred and fifty one minutes, and it had a budget of one hundred and forty million dollars, which had a box office return of five hundred and fifty three million dollars. <laughs> now. Prepare yourselves, gentlemen, because I will tell you what, the critics, oh, the critics, on Rotten Tomatoes, this got a amazing 38%. So, yeah. (laughs) 75% audience score, but it got a 38%. Definitely a rotten score from Rotten Tomatoes. Um, IMDb, it's about a 6.5 out of 10. Um, We're looking at Swashbuckler's numbers here, folks. Yes. Swashbuckler didn't have the audience score, though, of 75%. The audience didn't like it either. No, which, you know, makes sense because it was bad. (laughs) (laughs) That explains it. Oh, of course. (laughs) But Armageddon, it was a hit. It was definitely a hit. It definitely uh, concreted Michael Bay as a action director because it was Jerry Bruckheimer, who we know from the amazing movies that came out the year, I think, two years or so before in Batman Forever, he definitely produced that one. Or he directed that one. He also produced the movie we've watched. Yes. Which one? Days of Thunder. Oh, that's right. That's right. And didn't he also do Top Gun? Mm, I don't know. I'd have to look that one up. I just, I know, I know he did. When I get to my trivia section, I just, I know that Jerry Bruckheimer did Days of Thunder. But continue, Josh, please. This is your moment. Yes, but, uh, so it had a worldwide gross of $553 million. And on a budget of $140 million, even for 1998 money, that's still pretty damn good. But uh, its opening weekend, amazingly enough, did not have a lot of going on for it. I mean, Armageddon premiered at number one. It grossed $36 million. It uh, was the really only movie that premiered that weekend. So the top five looked like at number one was Armageddon. Number two was Eddie Murphy's Dr. Doolittle. Number three was Mulan. Number four was Out of Sight. And number five was The X-Files. Other notables in the box office at this weekend was The Truman Show, Six Days, Seven Nights, Hope Floats, Godzilla. You're going to know this next one, Deep Impact, (laughs) and Titanic. Wait, I thought Armageddon came out before Deep Impact. No, it came out after. Oh, mm-hmm. I Deep Impact was on its ninth week of release. Wow, wow. Man, these are some lousy films coming out during the box office. Holy cow. Yeah, we, we noted what was it, 94 when Bill and Ted came out it was an amazing year for movies. Mm-hmm. A mere four years later. It would look like the inside of a toilet after a Taco Bell run. <laughs> I thought Bill and Ted came out in 92 because it was beaten by Terminator 92. 2. I, I yeah, because it was beaten my, by uh, Terminator 2. So. Yeah, I may have got my years. 92 but yeah, was we're an just, amazing we year for movies. Yes. 92, 89, this is the exact opposite. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, with the exception of maybe like one or three of those films. Wow. Talk about your dud. It's also a stark contrast because like, I remember when you did the box office rundown for Bill and Ted and you listed all the movies that were out the same weekend that Bill and Ted was out like Terminator two, Robin hood, Prince of thieves, Bill and Ted's bogus journey, obviously like you rattle off all these movies. And I think about like six or seven of them were like, I like those movies. I remember those movies. I have fond memories. Okay. You've just rattled off a bunch of movies in this, that came out around this time. And I've seen most of those. I've seen Godzilla hope floats, Deep Impact, Armageddon, you know, I've seen these movies, and uh, honestly, with, outside of Armageddon, I don't remember having fun seeing any of them. Yeah, a lot of those movies is like, yeah, Godzilla, I, I remember that was one of the movies that we got out of school to go see, because I think it was in eighth grade that year, and same thing with uh, D- like Deep Impact, I remember watching it, but I was watching that on VHS after it came out, mm-hmm. but it's like, I remember watching these movies, and I probably, and I know I loved Godzilla at that age, but as an adult... 
they suck. Yeah. Yeah. Like those movies you listed. Yeah. Those movies you listed for Bill and Ted. Like I still go back and occasionally watch those movies because they're so awesome. I haven't seen a lot of these movies in a long time because I don't want to watch them again. I mean, I see Godzilla pop up all the time whenever someone's doing a worst movies list. I hope we get to that movie someday. I don't. We need to. But we don't need to rush. <laughs> no. <laughs> we don't. We don't. It's one of those things. It's like, if we look, look, if if it's near the exit, we'll stop and get off. But I'm not going out of my way. Yeah. And I've got to be able to see it from the interstate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not going by the signs. <laughs> But do you have any other uh, box office uh, info, Josh? Uh, well, uh, it did. Uh, I did want to say one last thing. It was. Um, it only lasted one week at number one. Really? Wow. Which, uh, remembering back at the time, it's like I'm, I, I want to say I felt like it was at number one for a couple of weeks. Because I mean, the '90s, like stuff being at the box office for more than a week was common. Well, what beat it? Lethal Weapon Four. Wow! Wow! Oof. That's another one that's like, oof. Oh. What mm. what the hell? It was like yeah, unnecessary sequels. Yeah, that's uh yeah, Lethal Weapon Four is uh is not good. It's not. But it's funny because looking at the uh, box office, it's like its first week of release it was at number one. Its second week of release it was at number two, and its third week of release it was at number three. Its fourth week of release it was at number five. Fifth week it was a number. It's like the Fibonacci sequence. <laughs> Wow, the, I, that's also astounding. Because maybe I'm misremembering, but the advertising that went behind the film it was everywhere. Was nuts. Yeah. yeah, I remember. I remember the the movie theater at the mall, Tom. That we you know we grew up with. Mm-hmm. I remember the movie theater had that giant Armageddon like sign mm-hmm. right outside the theater. Like it was just this huge cardboard cutout sign. That, like it just says Armageddon. And it just had the asteroid just slightly approaching Earth, and it just had the date that the movie was coming out. Like, yeah, maybe I'm misremembering this too, but like Taco Bell had a whole bunch of like um, meals and you know, like Armageddon blast, like you know, Mountain Dew shit. This summer, it isn't the heat or the humidity; it's the hot new movie Armageddon. So chill out with a new McDonald's McFlurry ice cream with cookies or candy blended in. It was crazy. Keep in mind, we're coming off the coattails of Titanic, too. So Titanic had that epic run at the box office. But this one, too, I think would also maybe have cemented it in our uh, memories is the fact that the song was played nonstop on the radio. Yes. I have trivia about that, too. So when we get to me, I won't step on you. Well, how's about this? I won't step on your toes there, Tom, Dan. So uh, why don't you go ahead and give some trivia on that? Well, speaking of which... The song that was don't a much better a segue. Thing. Very good. That was a much it better was. segue. Right. And I ruined it. So, so. <laughs> speaking of which, I, I apologize for the, keeping interrupting. <laughs> God damn it, Josh. Uh, Continue, Dan. <laughs> no. right. Speaking of which, speaking of which, that that song, I don't want to miss a thing by Aerosmith. In their storied career dating back to the 70s of Aerosmith, I don't want to miss a thing was their first ever number one hit it's their first song to debut at number one you're shitting me oh shit no no you think about all the classic aerosmith songs and i mean going all the way back to like you know walk this way dude looks like a lady dream on and then like they had that resurgence in the 90s of of like you know love in an elevator tell me what it takes of course and Liv tyler's in this movie so like she was in a bunch of the videos for amazing and crying and crazy. All of these big Aerosmith hits and their first number one hit was I Don't Want to Miss a Thing. A love ballad attached to this movie. Amazing. Where Steven Tyler's daughter bangs Batman. Yeah. <laughs> and Daredevil. Or Daredevil, depending on which continuity you're going with. But He was closer to being Daredevil than he was to being Batman in this scenario or at this time. Right. So, and then speaking of I Don't Want to Miss a Thing, Celine Dion was actually originally asked to record the song, and uh, she didn't want to do it, so she passed on it, leading to Aerosmith recording and singing it instead. The world is better for this. Agreed. But for those Celine Dion fans out there, don't worry. Spoiler alert, her career didn't suffer. 
So yeah, she didn't definitely make billions of dollars off of Titanic just a yeah, few months she, earlier. Yeah, she was not hurting considering how many like big theme songs she did for movies even before Titanic. Yeah, we didn't need any more Celine. But uh, enough about the song. I just thought that was the, the two little bits I learned about the song. I'm like, I could not believe that was Aerosmith's first number one hit. I love Aerosmith. Like I got that from my dad, and it was so funny. Like when they had that resurgence in the nineties and I got into Aerosmith, I remember my dad was like going, you're listening to Aerosmith. I'm like, yeah. And then like, he found my tapes, my Aerosmith tapes were in his car. So <laughs> he started off proud. Like, oh, my boy's listening to Aerosmith. And I don't want to listen. <laughs> I don't know you. <laughs> Actually, no, I didn't. I, I didn't particularly care for this song when it, uh, first came out but uh, it's grown on me over the years it's like a fun, kind of a guilty pleasure. yeah it's kind of a guilty pleasure song now so well the it, it's it's a it's fitting because so is the movie yeah the movie <laughs> the movie's a guilty pleasure movie too speaking of guilty pleasures and being caught with your pants down and being caught guilty nasa actually shows this film during their management training program uh new managers are given the task of spotting as many errors as possible in this movie the current <laughs> The current NASA record is 168 errors have been found. <laughs> and even then, the number <laughs> seems small. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, uh, NASA uses this for their management training program. Another bit of trivia. NASA was actually all on board with this movie. They actually got to film at the Kennedy Space Center. They got to film uh, in, in certain places that aren't normally accessible to the public, like the uh, big deep water pool that they use to train astronauts in zero G and stuff like that. So like NASA like opened up the books for this mostly because they thought that this movie would be like their version of Top Gun, like Top Gun comes out, Navy recruitment goes through the roof. It's not that NASA was looking for more recruitment because NASA does it. They just wanted good PR. NASA, NASA wanted good PR and obviously it would help with more funding. So um, again, NASA was all on board with this movie. They just they opened up the red carpet and just basically let them shoot all over the place. Michael Bay, his camera crew, ever, the actors, they were working around equipment that cost more than the budget for this movie. The budget for this movie is about 140 to 150 million dollars. They were working around equipment that's in the billions. Well, shit, just the uh, the one scene where Ben Affleck is in the. Uh, sorry to steal some trivia. No, here. no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. But. Uh... That one scene when he's coming out of the uh, neutral buoyancy lab, the underwater thing where they practice being weightless, the suit that he is in costs like $60,000. Yeah, yeah, they had, yeah. Like I said, they were filming and walking and even climbing on equipment that costs more than the movie's entire budget. In fact, some of the stuff they were working around cost more than the gross amount of money the movie actually made. So even if they had broke it, they wouldn't have been able to pay for it. I just think that that's amazing like i said nasa both loves and derides this film like they love the fact that they got all this publicity for it they love the fact that you know they had a great time with the actors and crew and michael bay like they they had a great time with them but at the same time they use this in their training their management training they're like sit down you tell us how many errors are in this movie and we'll see if you can be a manager here at nasa and so far the record is 168 so <laughs> that's hilarious Honestly, if I worked at NASA, I'd also feel a little insulted that the the notion that it's easier to train drillers to be astronauts than it is astronauts to be drillers. Yeah, Ben Affleck actually brought that up to Michael Bay and was told to shut the fuck up and go with it. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Ben Affleck asked Michael Bay, he's like, honestly, wouldn't it be easier to just train astronauts to drill? And Michael Bay told him to shut the fuck up and just film the movie. I saved you from Kevin Smith films. I will send you back to them, son. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of funny that Ben Affleck actually, he's one of the only actors in this film that doesn't really like it. Like Billy Bob Thornton straight up admitted that he only did the movie for money and he was contractually obligated for, to the studio to film a movie, and he did it. Although he's later said, it's not that bad of a film. It's just not one of the movies that he's like overly proud of. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Steve Buscemi's in the movie asked, why did you do this movie? Steve Buscemi straight up said, I was expecting another kid, and I needed a bigger house. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Like, mm -hmm. a lot of them have said, like, they don't hate the movie. They just, they're, they're honest about why they did it. Money. Mm -hmm. And um, Bruce Willis enjoyed the movie. He enjoyed filming the movie. He's not ashamed of the movie. Bruce Willis fucking hates Michael Bay and refuses to work with him ever again. And he hasn't. Yeah, but how much, again, knowing what we know about Bruce Willis and his um, 
temperament sometimes. Right. Is that really Michael Bay or is that Bruce Willis? Honestly, I'm less inclined to believe that it's Michael Bay because I've heard a lot of stuff about him on set. Like he's one of those guys who is like, you know, love or hate his movies. From my understanding is he's an awesome human being and he really treats his crew and his cast like royalty, basically. Yeah. And he gets he gets some of the same actors into his movies. So he definitely has people that want to work with him again. But Ben Affleck is ashamed of this film. Like he, he's he's come up and said, like, oh, that's one. It's probably the worst film I've ever done. And he gets red faced when people bring it up and he gets really embarrassed about it. This guy did Geely. <laughs> God damn it, you stole my joke. <laughs> yeah, you, you did Geely, okay? You did Jersey Girl, all right? You did Daredevil, for fuck's sake. The, the, that playground fight scene in Daredevil is worse than this entire film. Sit down and <laughs> shut up, okay? You, you were a good Batman, but honestly, this... Th- stop. Stop. All right? Seriously. But yeah, anyways, but... But we still love you, Ben. Oh, yeah, we, yeah. Yeah, no, we still love you, Ben. I, I do love Ben. I just, I find it funny that the movies that actors are embarrassed about. You're like, wait, <laughs> how, why are you embarrassed about? You did Geely. Uh, but that's most of what I got. I don't want to go on for too long. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's most of what I got other than. Um, I, uh, I don't think you missed a thing there, Nigel. <laughs> there we go. Really I've been not. saving that bullet for a minute. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I'm totally not going to abuse it yeah. at all. Speaking of, speaking of, I don't want to miss a thing. The original script did not include the romantic subplot between Ben Affleck's character and Liv Tyler's character. Instead, it had more emphasis on Truman, who I believe is Bruce Willis's character in the movie. The romantic subplot was added after the success of the previous year's Titanic had with teenage girls. Uh, Most of the romantic scenes were written by someone else and were filmed late into production. So if they feel out of place, it's because they are. Well, yeah, I think what was it? The entire wedding scene in the end credits was filmed by Ben Affleck in his own personal camcorder. Yes, it was. Ooh, early start in his directorial career. Ah, and I did not know that. That's that's I think that's all I got. I I can I can add some more trivia as we watch the movie and stuff like that. I I try not to go for too long on these segments. No, you leave that to me. That and I don't want to go into too much of the metadata. So because that is Tom's job. Yes, yes. What we could have expected and what you can expect from this film if you've never heard of this film, and what why would you want to watch this or even stay away from it? And I gotta say, this is what you can expect from this film. It is all action. And more action. Michael Bay, the bane of Hollywood and anyone who thinks he killed good directing. This guy, Transformers, Pearl Harbor. At this point in his career, he was known for music videos. Vanilla Ice, Donny Osmond, Meatloaf, and the Aaron Burr commercial for Got Milk. He uh, also apparently thinks that this is his worst film. <laughs> Then he did Transformers 4. (laughs) Yeah, he was quoted as saying, I will apologize for Armageddon because we had to do the whole movie in 16 weeks. It was a massive undertaking and it was not fair to the movie. I would redo the entire third act if I could. Uh, He's warmed up to the movie in recent years. I'm sure Transformers 2 and Pearl Harbor had something to do with that. So, yeah. Yeah, when you have those to contrast it with, yeah, kind of, your your opinion changes. But you have yourself a director who's known for just schlock action. He was coming off of Bad Boys and The Rock, so his star was rising. And let's not kid ourselves, The Rock, best movie he's ever done. But he was a director with a lot to prove and not a lot of his trappings that he fell into. Later movies... He became very Michael Bay, but here he was still not as Michael Bay as he could be. But the writers, this is another film which actually this worries us or would worry most people. We have multiple writers. There were like four or five writers and they're all ands, no ampersands. So it's like someone wrote a film and then someone else took that script and rewrote it, rewrote it. Well, some of these writers are actually pretty good. Jonathan Henslin, who's, whose credits were Jumanji, Punisher, and Die Hard with a Vengeance. Yeah, Tony Gilroy did Dolores Claryborn and would eventually do Born Ultimatum. Shane Slerno did Shaft, the, the 2000s. Rob Roy Poole, did he did Outbreak, and J.J. Abrams. Yeah, most Star Trek, the Star Wars films. Yeah, 
most modern audiences know the fame and infamy of J.J. Abrams, but almost all of these writers have knew their action. They especially just like where things blow up, action scenes, the plot second to whatever's happening on screen. The actors, it's a this is a star-studded cast. Bruce Willis, who plays Harry Stamper, we knew him from Die Hard, all the Die Hards, and he had a whole bunch of other action films. You had the draw of Bruce Willis, he was the draw. You had Billy Bob Thornton, the character actor, who plays old and surly guy like a pro. You had Ben Affleck, the hot rising star as A.J. Frost. We know him as Batman now, but for this time period, he was coming off of Kevin Smith films. Mallrats and Chasing Amy. He had just did a, a little bit in Goodwill Hunting, so he had some stuff to prove. And then there was Liv Tyler playing Grace Stamper as the hotness. So if you want the cute 90s girl, she was your girl. Daughter of Steve Tyler from Aerosmith. She was in so many of his music videos. We know her, of course, now as Arwen from Lord of the Rings, but she was just coming off of Empire Records, which is the most 90 film the 90s ever produced. Then you have your other who's who's of bit characters. You got Steve Buscemi, Owen Wilson, Michael Clark Duncan, Keith David, who you would recognize, Goliath from Gargoyles, and I cannot remember his character's name from They Live. So you've got all the draw. You you knew in the 90s who each and every one of those actors and actresses were. You might not have quite known Michael Bay. You definitely wouldn't have really known the writers by name, but you would have seen their stuff. So this was just action. People who know action. Hot chick. Hot dude. Bruce Willis. Explosions. So going into this film, no plot. All action. Explosions. Michael Bay. And that's the metadata. So if this that's your kind of film, then this is your kind of film. You are welcome. Josh. So, Tom, I am curious, is that your kind of film? If done well, I'm not going to lie. I do like a bit of cheesecake. You can't go wrong with cheesecake. I don't know if this film is done well. I I have fond memories of this film from the olden days, since we have naturally segued into expectations, I haven't seen it since the old days. I owned it on VHS, and every time I hung out with my friends, especially my chick friends, they all wanted to see Armageddon. It wasn't for the love scenes. It was for the explosion. So this film... It it did that well. I saw a few clips recently when I was looking up some stuff for this film. This the CG does not hold up. Just gonna spoil that right now. And I'm worried that with an adult eye, I'm just going to wonder why the hell I like this. But like I said before, this is still earlier Michael Bay when he still kept himself within the fence and kept didn't go to Michael Bay with his movies. And I think this is still a time frame when Bruce Willis was acting and he actually cared about what he did. So I think uh, if anything else, I'm going to have nostalgic fun with this film. A lot of moments I'm going to cringe at, wonder why the hell I ever liked this film. But I know I'm getting into a movie that's not scientifically accurate. It's just going to, it's popcorn. It's turn your brains off, watch a bunch of oil drillers try to blow up a moon rock with nukes. And hopefully, hopefully it's not so offensively dumb that I can't not hate it like um, uh, Die Hard 2. What about you, Nigel? What are you hoping or what are you expecting from this? I'm expecting cheeseball popcorny goodness. This movie is the very definition of a popcorn film. This is not anything that you're going to want to get too deep into. And this is definitely a movie you need to turn your brain off to enjoy even a little bit. Because uh, if you start overthinking some of the um, massive <laughs> asteroid sized plot holes, <laughs> you're going to go crazy. It's the um, size of Texas, sir. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, Wait, if the why are the mountains? Why does this asteroid have mountains? Why are they so brittle? Stop thinking about it, Dan. <laughs> In the words of Michael Bay, shut the fuck up. 
<laughs> um, but what am I expecting out of this movie? I'm, I'm not expecting a good film. I'm expecting a fun film. I know that this, this movie is definitely cheesy. It's been a while since I've seen it. Like, cause going back to what Josh was saying or what I was saying to Josh during his rundown of the box office was a lot of these movies in 98, I I've, I've haven't seen in a while because I don't want to, like, I don't, I don't have any desire to go back and watch these. My favorite part about Armageddon and the part I am looking forward to seeing tonight is the soundtrack. You can say what you want about Michael Bay, how you can rate his qualities as a director on his movies. And that's fair. But every single one of his films, and I've seen every single one of his films for better or for worse. He finds the right people to score his movies. I don't know what it is. I mean, the, the Transformers movies are stupid, but I love the score. And same with Bad Boys and same with this film and The Rock. Like he finds the best composers to score his movies. It adds weight. It adds some unchka into the uh, uh, moments that he's wanting to show uh, the uh, on the screen. You know, um, it makes it more than just a little explosion fair and all that. that. I think that's why a lot of the Michael Bay uh, copycats don't really translate as well as he does because they don't they don't really have the score to go with their movies i don't know what it is he's just got an eye for, or an ear for music i'm expecting to have fun watching this movie i want to have fun i haven't seen it in a while but i kind of want to have fun watching it again i do know that it's got some funny moments in it but i think I'm, I'm really hoping i'm not too far removed from this film that i hate it watching it because I kind of got that sense with Die Hard 2 last week. I remember liking Die Hard 2, and then we watched it last week, and I watched it with a critical eye, and I'm like, this movie is really bad sequel to Die Hard. <laughs> <laughs> Not as bad as the most recent, but it's the second worst. <laughs> you know, so, but yeah, but that's those are my expectations. I'm just expecting a fun film, and I really hope it delivers. What about you, Josh? Yeah, I, I, I got to agree with your comment on Die Hard 2, but I uh, sometimes like trash, so... But I know this one. I uh, Normally I go through and I say I've seen a... Uh, it's been like 20 years since I've seen a movie. It's been like two months since I've seen this one. Damn, Josh, you could not wait. Yeah, well, it was on Netflix. Me and the wife couldn't find something to watch. We're like, let's watch Armageddon. So we threw it on. It's as bad and it's as good as I remember. Like, I like this movie, but it is just so not good. It's one of those movies that's like, you. it's a guilty pleasure. It's a, you know, it's a dark indulgence. Um, you acknowledge that it's not a good movie. I got to say, it's very fitting for Dan's uh, put your brain out or take your brain off and go for a test drive uh, movie uh, extravaganza. Because, I mean, that's exactly what this movie is. I mean, don't expect anything great out of it. Don't expect the Academy Award winning acting. Don't expect a story that's going to make you go, huh? Go in expecting a cheese ball popcorn flick. You won't be disappointed. So I know exactly what I'm going in for the bar is average so i'm i'm looking forward to this movie but at the same time i know what i'm going to be getting and i know i'm not going to be like floored by it unless i walk into the bar which is very possible <laughs> i'm just envisioning that too it's like bam thud <laughs> there it is <laughs> but uh i guess now that we've heard about what uh we have basically thought about the movie because I mean we all had our own reviews. Do you guys want to hear what other people have thought about this? Uh, Absolutely movie? not. Why, Josh? It sounds like you've got something to say. I do. Well, since the Air Force put me up in a refrigerator to stay in this weekend, I uh, wrote it, and I hope it doesn't suck. So if it does, I'm going to blame my the refrigerator that I'm staying in. But uh, some people really like this movie. They really did. So um, yeah, I didn't script anything out because I was so cold. My fingers got frostbite. <laughs> Seriously, the heater has been on for like three or four hours and it's raised 10 degrees. So it's just a hair under 60 degrees. They spare no expense where, when they send Josh off on deployments. Yeah. This, yes. That's what I get for. It's not a deploy. It's just a standard freaking weekend warrior UTA weekend. It's like, seriously, I'm freezing. <laughs> But uh, anywho, I was cold while writing this, and hopefully these uh, reviews are hot. Boo. So, Tom, since you had probably the worst quiz we've had ever, obviously I'm going to give this to Dan to start. <laughs> Predictable as always. <laughs> Take a drink. All right, so what quiz you got for us this time, Josh? 
Well, it's a one-worded name, and I'm not going to go back into a one-worded title. So uh, just that's next. I just picked some really awesome reviews, and we're just going to pick a line, a random line out of the review, and we're just going to go off from there. So, Nigel, are you ready one to hear 10. this one? Yeah, one through ten. Obviously, Price is Right rules. Double points if you get it on the money. Okay. So this was said by 85122212 in August of 2011. This movie is in my brains. This movie is in my soul. This movie is in my heart. Armageddon is a movie of my childhood. Eight out of ten. Six out of ten. Ooh, Nigel got it. That was a ten out of ten review. Ooh, wow. That's actually. I was expecting that one to be kind of like a, one of those sly ones. All right, all right, all right. That's yeah. fine. That's fine. All right. Thompson. Thompson. Here you mm-hmm. go. This was done by Mac Dash Forty Twenty Three in October of ninety eight. Bruce Willis is not my favorite actor. After all, some of his movies have shown his bad actor side, but he does a decent job in this movie along with the rest of the cast. Ten. What was it again, Josh? Read it one more time. Bruce Willis is not my favorite actor. After all, some of his movies have shown his bad actor side, but he does a decent job in this movie along with the rest of the cast. Tom said ten. I'm going to say six. It was a ten-star review. Holy wow. shit! Jesus. Yeah, wow! So it is Tom 2, Dan 1. So Dan, let's see if you could take this lead again. This was done by Lebowski T100014 in October of 2002. <laughs> These are the best names, aren't they? <laughs> he said, I have to say that, on the whole, I liked Deep Impact much more. But that doesn't mean Armageddon isn't a good movie. It, in its own right, Armageddon has some good things going for it. 7 out of 10. Thompson? 10 out of 10. It was another 10 out of 10 review. <laughs> Are all of these? Th- that's fantastic. Oh, my God. <laughs> Holy shit. Ouch, Dan. That hurts. <laughs> but, yeah, I had to put this one in because he liked Deep Impact more, yet he gave Armageddon a 10 out of 10 review. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> all right. So, Nigel. All right. Is it Nigel's turn? It is Nigel's turn. Okay. Mark C-55 wrote in November of 2000, I can't remember when I've seen a worse movie. I swear, if this is another 10-star review. <laughs> um, I'm going to say two. Thompson? I'm, I'm going to let it ride, Josh. Ten. Oh, Nigel got this one. That was a one-star review. Okay, okay. <laughs> I figured you'd change it up by the end. <laughs> I thought about doing all 10 star reviews. I'm not going to lie. All right. So, Thompson. Yes. I think you've pretty much got it because it's four to two right now. Mm-hmm. But uh, Nigel can still come back. So, if he gets this one on the money, we will go into our tiebreaker. But you got to get it wrong, and Tom- Dan's got to get it on the money. So, mm-hmm. you get the first shot. This one's by Intel Earts 2. He wrote in May of 2011. I saw this at the cinema when it came out and watched it again on TV when it comes round. Though very good in place, the overall effect for this viewer is barely passable. Probably wrong though, but I'm going to say four. I'm going to say five. And I guess we're going on to a tiebreaker. Ah! Five out of ten. (laughs) Holy shit, Nigel! (laughs) <laughs> oh my god. I thought it was going to be like a 302. Man. So, for the tiebreaker question, Michael Dash Stenlund 17 said in May of 2019 Sorry, the critics couldn't do their job well enough for us on this title. Even they make mistakes from time to time. It's okay to be wrong. <laughs> uh, 10 star review. Because the critics, the critics hate this movie. Thompson? Hmm. Josh, I, it probably is 10, but Josh probably threw a, uh, a slider in on this one. It's close. I, I'm going to say a nine star. Dan, good luck on uh, quiz next week. It was a 10 star. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> what a comeback. What a comeback. That's awesome. <laughs> Do you believe in miracles? I, I figured it seemed too obvious that it was a 10 star at the end. I like, no, this is going to be a nine star just to fuck with us. Damn it. Well, it wasn't a complete shutout for me, so I'm I'm going to count this in the W category. It's, it's the moral victory. 
I uh, normally I like to pepper my uh, reviews. I do a low one, a high one, a mid one, and a middle one. This time I'm like, you know what? Fuck this. This is Armageddon. I'm gonna give it as many ten stars as I can fit in. I figured it such when you were talking earlier, like, oh, this this has some like uh, uh, a lot of people like this. Like, is he really? Is he? I'm going to just. Oh my god, he might be. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I won. I came from behind. Tom still sucks, but Tom better play the music. Welcome back to another astronomical episode of The Fire Pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and NASA mission control technician, Tom. Now listen up. We have an asteroid the size of Texas coming in hot. We have exactly two weeks to intercept, drill in the nuke, and detonate where we can all say hi to the dinosaurs. So NASA has chosen you to do absolutely nothing. We have astronauts for this sort of thing. Shh, like we just pick anyone to go into space. But thank you for picking us here at the fire pit. We're on the last lap on our Groundhog Day parade to Punxsutawney, leaving on a jet plane with Aerosmith and into Armageddon. And as we round out this journey, we're going to be coasting for a few short episodes with a mid-season break. So we're going to be hosting some Q&As about the podcast. If you have any questions you'd like to ask us, anything you'd like to know, or just have been curious about, whether it's the podcast itself or any of us in particular, or you just have some general questions in general, you can shoot them off to us at any time. Details on how will be provided at the end of the episode. In the meantime, I wonder if the teams had any more troubleshooting calls come in lately. Mmm, that's good coffee. Oh my god, so guys, did you hear about the mirror blowing up? So, you wanna know something? You wanna know what really caused it? Fucking cable management. The Russians and their damn cable management. It's disgusting! It's the Wild West up there. Yeah, cable management. It's, uh, yeah. This is a cool desk, Dan. Love this little... What's this? This is really cool. Beep, 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 beep. Don't touch my stuff. You want to know something else? That shuttle crash could have been avoided if... Ooh. Ooh. What? I think I figured out how to solve the remote detonator problem. Uh, hi. Uh, yes, uh, this is Dan from NASA IT. I'm calling back about your remote detonator problem. Grace, I know I promised you I was coming home. I don't understand. Oh, jeez. Uh, sir, I think you had me conferenced in on your other call. <sighs> Looks like I'm going to have to break that promise. Sir, can, can you hear us? I'm trying to solve your remote detonator issue. What's going on, Dan? I don't know. I don't think this dude knows that we're on his call. Just put it on the speaker. I want to hear. Oh my god, yes, please. Genius! Crazy. I want you to know AJ saved us. Did. Uh, sir? Hello, sir? Seriously, how can he not hear us? I don't know. He must have one of those old, like, cricket walkie-talkie phones or something. Remember those? Sir, it's an easy fix. Take your finger off the talk button so you can hear me! Yeah, yell louder while it's muted, Dan. That always works. I love you, Grace. Gotta go now, honey. Sir, hold down the reset button. Just hold down the... Anyway, that shuttle should have been running Linux. Oh my god. Not this again. Whew. I don't know if he'll be back again. Oh boy. But if you want to hit back at us with some ads or recommendations, or just want to hit us up in general, feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Just be sure to put fire pit in the subject line, as well as what you're emailing about. Whether it's, you know, an ad spot, a question spot, a hot spot, a bench spot, or you just want to spot us some love, then we'll read it, send it to NASA, launch it into space, slingshot around the moon, land and drill it deep into a passing comet, and let it detonate without ever responding. It's us, 
You should know how this works by now. But that email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com, capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I, at gmail.com. Oop, that's my cue to suit up for launch. And apparently it is easier to train an editor to be an astronaut than the other way around. Who knew? But thank you all for listening, and as always, good luck. Boost mission and lift off. And now to check on the team to see how they're enjoying their movie. Snake, talk to me. There's your shuttle launch. There's my erection. And here we hear the soothe, Woo. soothing voice of one Charleston Heston as he narrates our lives. Go, Charleston. Speak to me. This is the Earth at a time when the dinosaurs roamed a lush and fertile planet. Oh. Don't say the line. Say it, Dan. For fuck's sake. Hey! Yeah, there it is. Why would he be on an MMU and not tethered? To his device. Well, now that's the least of his worries. One of the, the flaws of this scene is actually that uh, all these asteroids li- flying through the air would raise the ambient temperature above the uh, combustion temperature of wood. Basically, the ambient temperature in New York City right now with this many asteroids falling would be over 660 degrees Fahrenheit. So everybody would, they would literally turn New York into an oven. Because you got to keep in mind, those things are hitting the atmosphere, going at probably ten to 20,000 miles an hour. The friction that they are making with the air is causing it to just heat up, rapidly heat up. Like, the uh, surface of those asteroids as they're making collision is set in the several thousand degrees. So, the devastation would be worse if they showed it accurately, is what you're saying. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Holy shit. I wish Keith David was in charge of the world. That would be some heavy shit to take in, you know? Right? Like, by the way, there's a big old rock the size of Texas coming in a few weeks. Yeah, and they want us to go on a highly dangerous mission to maybe have a snowball's chance in hell of stopping it. (laughs) Who's in? I kind of need an answer now. Boy, they really got their money's worth out of the Aerosmith in this movie. (laughs) Right? It's like the fourth Aerosmith song I've heard. This is a typical Michael Bay film. You solve a Rubik's Cube, you're smart, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Anybody who knows how to do a Rubik's Cube is not difficult. It does not take major brains to put together a Rubik's or to solve a Rubik's Cube. Maybe for you, Josh. That was my subtle jab at calling you dumb, Tom. <laughs> well, unfortunately, I wasn't smart enough to get it, Josh. <laughs> Owen Wilson is always Owen Wilson. Fun fact Earth is large enough that uh, gravity is constant pretty much all the way around the surface. Yeah, But uh, because the moon is so, it's not as dense as Earth, Mm -hmm. and uh, it's obviously not as massive, Mm -hmm. certain areas of the moon, actually gravity is affected differently because of uh, shallower and less dense areas. So does that mean like certain spots of the moon have less gravity than others? Less gravitational pull. Kind of like Liv Tyler's pulling on my uh, crotchal region. There's at least three, maybe four Gs right there. And then I see Ben Affleck, and I'm like, Batman. (laughs) And it's like six Gs. I may have a homoerotic crush on Ben Affleck. It's not homoerotic. It's just erotic. (laughs) Keith David disapproves. Did they really need to have Mir Space Station explode like this? Honestly, I'm impressed that we made it like a little over an hour since our last explosion in a Michael Bay film. Oh, is this the most unrealistic part of this movie? Security forces able to use a computer? (laughs) You know what? I'm okay with the machine gun being on that thing. How many, like, alien movies have we seen where they they see aliens, where they're not supposed to see aliens, and they all let you know you're thinking to yourself is, man, I wish they had guns. Yeah. You make a fair point. They don't know what's on that. I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. God, I would be crapping myself. All the way. With a massive erection. (laughs) Would be crapping myself, but I would have a massive erection. Owen Wilson is always Owen Wilson. 
Yeah, that's smart. Beat up the only guy who can fly the craft to get you home. Uh, guys, <laughs> one minute left. <laughs> Seriously, guys, uh, it's still the numbers are still going down. They're still going down. Uh, still going down. <laughs> the clock is literally ticking. Get <laughs> on with it. Yeah, <laughs> we are literally wasting time here. I can't stress this enough. Man, look at Ben Affleck just acting his ass off. Hi, Gracie. Grace, I know I promised you I was coming home. You think we should shut this off, guys? It's kind of a private moment. <laughs> There's literally 30 seconds left. They wouldn't have time to turn around. It's not a fucking Volkswagen. It's like, what are you going to do? Stop, turn in the neighbor's driveway and head back? I forgot my keys. Now I've lost my erection. Say the line. Say it, Dan. For fuck's sake. Hey! Yeah, there it is. And now, back to the episode. All right, well, you got this, the, the summary. Big Rock comes to Earth. Billy Bob Thornton assembles a team of astronauts that are actually oil drillers training to be astronauts. They blow up the rock at the end. Owen Wilson dies. Succinct, I love it. <laughs> no, I just... Uh, okay, hold on. All right, so we start the movie with Charlton Heston telling us about how the dinosaurs died. Well, if you believe in that kind of thing, because they didn't. They died in the flood. Anyways, so Charlton Heston tells us how the dinosaurs died with a big giant rock. And then he said, it's going to happen again. And sure enough, in the most Michael Bay way ever, New York gets pummeled with asteroids. Uh, and then they find the giant asteroid up in the sky. Billy Bob Thornton calls the president or the president calls him tells him that it's the size of texas big giant rock they want to know how they can stop it from destroying the earth uh they assemble a team of astronauts but then the astronauts figure out that they don't know how to drill things so they get the guy who designed the drill that they stole the designs from played by bruce willis he tells them uh, i'm gonna need my own team so instead of training astronauts to drill we're gonna ta train drillers to be astronauts and they only got a few days to do it so they put them through the ringer and nasa training then they send them up into space and then they blow up the Mir space station off to a great start and then uh they fly around the moon and slingshot behind the asteroid and then one of the other shuttles gets blown up or crashes uh and then the other one finally lands but misses the mark by like 20 some odd miles so now they got to drill through even harder denser rock and then they keep drilling but then um they lose the drill and their little armadillo thing that's what they're calling the drillers and then when another guy dies but then all of a sudden ben affleck shows up yay with the other driller he comes down and they hook up the other drill and then they make their depth of seven or eight hundred feet or something like that and then they drop down the nuke but then they said oh we can't remote in anymore and uh blow it up with remotely i hate when remote access doesn't work anymore like the chud that he is ben affleck draws the short straw and has to go down and blow up the asteroid manually but then at the last moment bruce willis tells him nope i'm gonna do it throws him back in the airlock and he goes out to blow up the asteroid and ben affleck has to go back to earth and make daredevil and then the rest of the survivors come down as heroes and the end I mean, it's not all bad for Ben Affleck. He does get a bang, Liv Tyler. That's true. That's true. He gets to bang Liv Tyler. So. But then after their amicable divorce, he goes and makes Daredevil, and she goes to make Lord of the Rings. That's <laughs> true. The '90s were better for one of these people. Anyway, so. <laughs> but Ben Aff Ben Affleck's currently trending upwards. So there you go. That's the summary, and I'm sticking to it. Josh, final thoughts. Go. It was good. Dan, what are your final thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> no, I like I liked it. It was a good movie. I'll always like it, but it is a terrible film. I'm going to be brief tonight because it's late and I need to go to bed. It was definitely not a good movie, but it was a great movie. And I stand by that statement. Dan? <laughs> is it a movie you would recommend to people? Stop it. <laughs> uh, well actually yeah i would recommend this movie because it's done it, it's the definition of a popcorn film it's dumb it's yeah. stupid fun it's an enjoyable movie you turn your brain off it's dumb it's completely dumb and stupid like the science doesn't work i, I, I mentioned in the while we were watching it that um michael bay treats the asteroid in the movie like a monster it even has its own roar which things don't roar in space because there's no sound but it has a roar 
and then the asteroid keeps basically trying to kill them because the the people on the asteroid are trying to kill the asteroid so the asteroid keeps trying to kill them back like it's some kind of a sentient being and th- honestly the asteroid's the only antagonist in the whole film and it's a non sentient life form well it's not even a life form it's a little hunk of rock so you really kind of need to watch this movie not because it's an accurate depiction of what it would be like if an asteroid really was coming to Earth. It's an accurate depiction of what an asteroid would be like coming to Earth and Michael Bay is filming the documentary. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like I said, the movie's dumb, stupid fun. I recognize it's a bad film, but I honestly enjoyed watching it again tonight. I think a lot of the performances are pretty good. Steve Buscemi is awesome. Um, I can't think of the guy, the actor, but he plays the Russian in the movie. He, he steals it as soon as he shows up. Owen Wilson's really charming and funny in the first part of the movie. And that's why you're kind of sad when he dies. He has kind of a um, non heroic death. It's just kind of a death that actually would probably happen if this mission was a real thing. So people are just going to die on rather un- unceremoniously. So yeah, he um, doesn't even make it to the asteroid. No, he no, he, dies, well, he, he makes dies. it to the asteroid. Yeah. He dies the in the show. Yeah. He dies in the shuttle. Crash. The asteroid makes it to him technically. Yeah. He literally dies because he can't get his helmet on in time. And like I said, it's really an unceremonious death. And it's kind of sad because his character was the most raw, raw of the whole thing. Like he was the one that said, this is like hero stuff. This is like, we're going to be superheroes doing this. And you're like, well, actually, Owen, only um, one actor in the room is going to be a superhero. You're not. So and he's going to be too. Also, Michael Clark Duncan will be a supervillain. Oh my God. I just put together that they were in the movie. Yeah. 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 I he's did Kingpin. Too. Holy shit. He's Kingpin. He's Kingpin. <laughs> So, oh my God. But so far, that's what I've got. I'll bounce some more thoughts off of you guys as we go on. Tom, what are your final thoughts on the film? Oh, give Michael Bay this much. He does know how to make things tense when they need to be tense. Um, but he doesn't know when to not make things tense. Uh, we were watching this, and you guys were pointing this out. I wonder, Well, actually, you made me realize this, and bless and curse you for this. There was a trend in the 70s, and most modern films, especially action films, have gone away from it, where there's the first half is kind of getting to know the team before the action. An uh, example of this is um, Dirty Dozen, where you watch the team train and get ready for the big mission, and then the mission happens. Yeah, the Italian then, Job's another good example of that. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of those other films. And... I was actually kind of getting a little refreshed on that because, like, we were getting to know these guys. We're watching them train. We're getting invested. And then you pointed out, Josh, that it felt like a just a bunch of segments of things happening while someone narrated over top. Not even the what's happening, just talking over it. B-roll and with voiceovers. B-roll with voiceovers. And I that's pretty much sums up the film it is 30 minutes of actual story with an hour and a half of padding right in the middle and honestly thank god for the romantic angle between Liv tyler and ben Affleck, has shoehorned in as it was because it was the most emotional sauce to an otherwise dry cheeseburger how five people couldn't come up with a story to this film but I'm going to add a little bit to your thoughts there, Nigel. Thank God for the actors in this, too. especially Ben Affleck. This guy was an underrated gem in this. He knew when to take the movie seriously and when to not take the movie seriously and play in the liminal space. It's like the scene, we were talking about the scene with him and Liv Tyler and the goodbye. And he just, you ad libbed, uh, or we think he ad libbed the leaving on the jet plane stuff. He was a standout in this film. I know Bruce Willis was the star, but he was, he stole the movie. Yeah. In my also, book. like when Bruce Willis is going to sacrifice himself and uh, he throws Ben Affleck's character, AJ, back into the airlock. And like Ben Affleck's like ugly crying in that scene. Like, you know, like, you know, Harry, don't do this. Harry, don't do that. You know, like, I love you. You can't do that. Like, you know, that's actually kind of hard to do, like, on cue like that. It's one of those things. It's like, there's Ben Affleck, we, we know him for his bad roles and we acknowledge his good roles, but there's a reason he's a household name. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's a good actor when he wants to be a good actor. He's actually a good actor even in movies where there aren't that great. We go up all the time on Batman v Superman. Shitty film, terrible film. Ben Affleck's the best part about it. He's a good Batman. 
And uh, yeah, it's like everybody. It's like most of the actors in that movie were great. It was the story that just was a. Yeah, I honestly don't like think the, he's the that bad in Daredevil. I don't think Daredevil. I don't think he's that bad in Daredevil. I think the rest of the movie around him sucks balls. Yeah, you know, like Jennifer Garner, the girl playing Electra, she's awful, so, and the script is bad. But like Ben Affleck, he's great in The Town. He was good in yeah. Argo. He was know. the bomb in Phantoms, yo's. That was a shitty film too, but he was the best damn part in it. He was. Yeah, and he's he's about you know the accountant. You know, like he's good in movies, even as bad as the bad movies are like, like Geely. He's not bad in Geely. Everyone else is really, really bad in Geely. And that's a very bad script. But he himself isn't bad. But Tom, what you were saying earlier about the acting, um, we were talking in the movie about like the most enjoyable Michael Bay movies, which are Bad Boys, this one, Armageddon, The Rock. And I would put Bad Boys 2 in that category. And I think that his best movies have really good actors in them. Like he, the actors that know when to take the movie seriously or when to ramp up the cheese or chew the scenery a little bit. Like The Rock. The Rock is a really serious film, but like Nicolas Cage knows when to pull it back and then knows when to like turn it up to Nicolas <laughs> Cage levels, you know? And same with like Bad Boys with Will Smith and Martin Lawrence, like the way they play off each other in that movie. Like those are his best movies. And then you go to like Transformers and he's like, he's got Shia LaBeouf. And Megan Fox. And Megan Fox. Like, I mean, they're pretty people. They're not great actors, but that's what I was thinking about that. You know, like the, the actors in this movie are just really good. And even Bruce Willis is really good in this movie. Oh yeah. He had a single tear going. It's like he acted. It's so refreshing to see Bruce Willis act in a mm-hmm. movie. God, when was the yeah, last? He did a good job him? of hopping between his two, his two roles, <laughs> soggy Bruce Willis and Bruce Willis. <laughs> yeah. I mean, hopped about as much as he did with that accent. It's, seriously. It's like, I don't know what he was trying, but I'm glad he stopped at a certain point. Yeah. It's kind of funny for a movie where a lot of the actors that are in this movie have openly admitted that they did it for a paycheck. They turned in some pretty good performances. I've seen movies where the actors literally just collecting a paycheck Mm -hmm. and you can tell they're just in there collecting a paycheck. But this one, Steve Buscemi, Billy Bob Thornton, they've admitted that, yeah, I did this movie for money. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But their performances are pretty good. It was a cheesy, fun film where the actors got to have fun. That's, and sometimes that's really what makes it. You know, when you can tell the the actors are miserable, it makes the movie miserable. This is one of those movies where I can definitely see the disconnect on Rotten Tomatoes. I can see why professional critics hate it. And why the audience loved it. <laughs> That's, you know, yeah. of- it's like, how much of that is nostalgia, too? I mean, if this movie came out today, would we be ribbing on it and saying it's a shit movie? Uh, I mean, maybe it did, it did come out at the right time because the, basically they did remake this movie with that, that movie where the weather system goes crazy. I was about to say, it's like, I think if Geostorm came out in the uh, 90s, it would have been a box office hit. Yeah, but it comes but it out now. Out like, it's like, yeah, this movie sucks. Yeah. Well, because it's trying to be a Michael Bay film. It's it's like um, Battleship. That's another film that wanted to be a Michael Bay film, but couldn't quite pull it off. You know, we don't think of Michael Bay as a director with a style, but he has a very particular style with his films. He's a hack, yes, but it's he know it's he's the only one that knows that trick i liken michael bay to hershey's chocolate and that to a lot of chocolate connoisseurs dessert connoisseurs hershey's is kind of like cheap end blue collar chocolate that's just it's okay but you know it's not that great Mm -hmm. there's way 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 better chocolate in the world but there's also have you ever had really 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 generic bad chocolate Yes. Yeah. I bet you take one bite of that and you're wishing for a Hershey bar. Yes. Yeah. So that's how Michael Bay is. Michael Bay is like cheap, blue collar, action y popcorn kind of movie making. He's not Spielberg, mm-hmm. but we've seen directors that are way, way worse or that try to copy him and just don't do it right, like Battleship. Well, it helps that he makes his worlds that his movies happen in fit his kind of exaggerated style. Like we were watching this, the set pieces, the NASA headquarters, every, the, the asteroid, or excuse me, the comet. None of it looked real. I mean, there was so much stainless steel. The freaking 
lander things had machine guns on them. It was something that right. a five year old would have come up with. But it, fit, it looked like a GI Joe vehicle. Yes, <laughs> but it fit him. If the world fit what his vision was, right. and so I think that works. Yeah, I, I agree. So I, I think uh, I think we had fun watching this tonight. Yeah. Shitty film, but you know it's. Popcorn. No, it's a it's a White Castle one. You're enjoying it at the moment, but boy, oh boy, it's going to suck in the morning. <laughs> right. But I, that's all my final thoughts there, team. So I think that does it for tonight's show. As a reminder, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, or wherever you get your podcasts. You know, be sure to like and subscribe as it really does help the podcast out. And be sure to join us on Discord and have some fun interacting with us, talking amongst our fans uh, and each other. It's been kind of quiet over there right now but that's just because we need more of you to join in so we have some things to talk about keep the conversations fresh and lively i mean we, we really do try to start a conversation about the movie we had just watched or the one that we had the episode we just posted on tuesday so join the discord and, and talk with us um and also be sure to like us on facebook and follow us on twitter and we're doing a QA and a for our mid-season break, which is coming up in two weeks. You know, we're, we're doing a QA. and a If you guys got questions for us about, you know, why do we do this? Why do we pick these movies? You know, we want to hear. And if you want to reach us uh, old school, uh, you can uh, hit us up on the email that was mentioned back in the interspersal. Uh, if you want to talk sponsorships or any other feedback or submissions or whatever, links to the email and our social media is in the episode description at firepit.podbean.com. For my side, I'd want to give a shout out to a few of our Facebook followers, Rena, Michael, and Travis, last names omitted for privacy reasons. Thank you for, you know, joining us on Facebook, following us there. Hopefully you're spreading the word and helping to keep the fire pits burning. Glad to have you here. And I'll give a special shout out to always Peggy, uh, old school friend of the channel. Thanks always for listening. Special shout outs to uh, work friends, Tyler, Nick, uh, Anthony. I'm glad you guys are listening. I hope you're enjoying it. I uh, always appreciate you guys, uh, your encouragement on it. And um, yeah. And I'll, uh, I actually have a shout out this week that isn't you guys or my parents, but I'm going to shout out my buddy uh, Robo. He's a buddy from playing uh, my Star Wars game from long past. He's down with the COVIDs. So I'm like, well, since you're down with the COVIDs, how's about I make it worse? Listen to my podcast. <laughs> so uh, I told him I'd give him a shout out this week if he listened to my podcast. So I hope he listened to the podcast. So feel better, dude. Good luck, buddy. Yeah. I think that's it for tonight's show. So where are we off to next week, Dan? Well, Tom, it's Groundhog's Day. Again. Fantastic. I'm excited for this one. And I look forward to talking about it when we get there. Again. Again. But until then, again, I've been Tom. I've been Dan. And I've been Josh. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Good luck out there. NASA IT, this is Dan. The comet we discovered is the size of New York City. If this comet continues on its path around the sun and keeps its present course, there's a chance that we might have impact. Sir, you have the wrong department. I want to close 